Hello there and welcome, a genuine welcome this time to Digital Foundry Direct Weekly number 186. It's our show where we discuss the latest gaming and technology news and man, we've got a lot to pile through this week. Uh, we're going to have a rotating panel for this one, but joining me for the first recording session, first of all, Oliver McKenzie. Hello. Yes, very interesting format today. Hopefully we can get through a lot of interesting <laughs> topics as well with our rotating panel. Mm -hmm. And uh, John Linneman, hello. Hey guys, does this panel have mode seven for that rotation or, <laughs> you know? It's an Aperture Grill panel. Oh, okay. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, but before we go on, as always, uh, a shout out to store.digitalfoundry.net, the home of our merchandising wares. So if you want to support the team, uh, well, first of all, consider the DF supporter program, but uh, you can, of course, grab our merch. Uh, as well. Um, let's go straight into the first news topic. Okay, so this one put the cat amongst the pigeons. Sean Layden, the ex-CEO of Sony Interactive Entertainment, has basically, um, well, what can we say? Uh, the, the point is that he says that the console arms race has plateaued. Uh, the exact quote, I'm looking at this uh, Video Games Chronicle uh, article here, that race is nearly over. And you know who won? AMD. <laughs> um some incendiary comments here um, and basically there's some sense to it and I also think there's things that I don't quite agree with but anyway um, let's talk about some quotes here uh, we've done these things this way for 30 years every generation these those costs went up and we realigned with it we've reached the precipice now where the center can't hold we cannot continue to do things uh, that we have done before so it's talking about the sustainability of game development here which i think by and large we agree with it's time for a real hard reset on the business model a hard reset on what is e what it is to be a video game it's not 80 hours it's not 90 hours uh, but if it is that's a whole different category um, again that's sustainability but talking about hardware um, he says that uh, basically technology, it has plateaued. We're at the stage of hardware development that I call only the dogs can hear the difference. If you're playing your game and sunlight is coming through your window onto your TV, you're not seeing any ray tracing. It has to be super optimal. You have to have an 8K monitor in a dark room to see those things. Really? Uh, we're fighting over teraflops and that's no place to be. We need to compete on content, jacking up the specs of the box. Mm. I think we've reached the ceiling. Um, John, I'm going to go to you first on this one. Um, interesting stuff, right? I think I pretty much agree with the sustainability stuff. Um, the technology stuff, a bit more contentious, but where do you sit on this? Yeah, I'm 100% there. I do fully agree with his initial part of the statement. And I actually think he's not wrong necessarily with the hardware stuff. It's just that his examples kind of show like a lack of understanding, right? Or it's like a bit over the top the whole 8k when whatever whatever any of that actually means but yeah we are at this <laughs> point where and i think everybody can feel it right games are becoming so unreasonably expensive to make they require so much time it feels like very few of them are actually successful these days uh because and when i say successful it means you have to sell x number of units to essentially make up for whatever development cost has been sunken into it uh right. there's just more people that need more money to survive uh and it's taking far longer to create things and i feel like i just don't know how we get out of that i mean you can see that there's still lots of smaller scale games being made people still enjoy those there's it doesn't have to be this, but the big companies are all targeting this sort of triple A level of game, and there's really no putting the genie back in the bottle easily, anyway. Uh, that's just users have been so, but then also, I was about to say users have been like conditioned to expect this, but only the users that are into those types of big budget games because we have another. A problem at the same time that I think is creating potential issues for the future, and that's the rise of the forever game. Not that these haven't existed before, but you know, we have the rise of stuff like Roblox and Fortnite and these various MMOs and all kinds of stuff where people join those games and that's that's what they play. They do not play other games, they don't want to play other games. And there's an entire younger generation of kids right now, they don't they don't care about buying games on these consoles they mostly do not they just want to play 
their game. They're in their world. That's what they do, uh, which makes this sort of like even more difficult. So it feels like you've got a lot of these big budget games being made still that are, it's becoming increasingly hard to justify it. And it's targeting this audience that grew up between a certain period of time, primarily. Um, and if it's not getting everyone, you can't make enough money to make it viable. And there's always exceptions to everything, but it just feels like the business is in a very dangerous spot. And then when you get to the hardware stuff, I I don't agree that only dogs can hear the difference, as he says. I know what he's saying when he says that, though. And I can kind of see where he's coming from, because I, th- I do think that the the it's increasing where the audience level or like the the you have to be at a certain tier to even be able to appreciate what's happening in the graphics space these days. We're maniacs about this stuff, right? We notice it. There's a lot of people that watch Digital Foundry that also notice this stuff. They care a lot. But, you know, when we're talking about, like, how do we showcase these differences? We we argued over how do they even show the PS5 Pro in that in that video. You know, in order to show differences on smartphones and smaller screens, we have to pause and zoom in and show this stuff up close. That stuff's all true. And the fact is, most people probably can't even notice it after a certain point. And I, it just like the problem is, is that each step up from there seems to require a significant amount of money to get there, to get that fidelity, right? So, but at the same time, you know, continuing to increase hardware power does at least make certain things easier for developers. It can make lower end games maybe you know those with teams that are maybe not as well versed in uh optimized programming be able to produce stuff that at least runs well so that stuff's good as so there is there is some room there but i i just don't think we can continue to see these kind of like traditional console upgrades that we saw in the past like you go back to when we went from playstation to playstation 2 right i remember when the metal gear solid 2 trailer hit e3 i watched it in like a little real video like a tiny little postage stamp on a desktop. And it didn't matter that it was a super low quality video. You could, you could tell that what was happening in that scene was unlike anything we'd seen before. Right? Like even through that little bit, we're now at the point where you basically have to pixel peep. (laughs) So, uh, yeah, it's, it's a weird situation, I think. And it all just, and I, so that all that is to say that I think I see where Sean is coming from. And I feel like we're just not going to be able to continue down this road of like big incremental upgrades by and large, except for maybe mm-hmm. Nintendo. They've, they've kind of got their own weird strategy going on. Okay. Um, Oliver, what do you make of all of this? Yeah. I mean, I kind of agree with his sentiments and I, I definitely sympathize with what, um, what Sean was saying there because I think that while I love incremental hardware gains, I don't think they're expanding the console market, which I think is critical. Um, right. At best, they're basically keeping it at a standstill in Sony's case. In Nintendo's case, they're doing something kind of totally different. In Microsoft's case, you know, this generation has not been a great success by any means. I don't think that improving image quality necessarily or targeting 8K displays or doing more very high frame rate titles, I personally don't think that moves the needle that much in terms of console adoption. Um, but I would say that not in the next year, not in the year after that, but maybe in the next five or 10 years, I do think I'd be more positive about it. Because when you look at the kinds of things that are possible with ray traced lighting in particular, that's kind of a categorical shift. And as hardware RT acceleration gets better, you can start to lose these kinds of heavily engineered solutions like Lumen, drop them for things like Reister, drop them for things that might be more powerful and simpler and easier to integrate into your games and produce better visual results. Um, And I think as time goes on, that visual uplift in lighting can be pretty powerful, especially as it applies to smaller scale games. So the big AAA games, you know, those always look beautiful, but I think these smaller scale games really do improve from there. And then I also think that if we're talking about getting people to buy new console hardware, new PC hardware in the future, you know, I think machine learning probably changes a lot of things in the medium to long term. Um, You know, if you think about it abstractly, Games are really entertainment that are predicated on interaction, and the thing that AI models are really good at is providing fast, generated feedback to interaction. So, you know, just just like kind of pulling an example out of nowhere that, that has maybe some application to games at some point, uh, OpenAI posted some research a few days ago where they basically posited that they could achieve a 50 times speed up in diffusion models through a new modeling uh, type that they're calling consistency modeling. Um, 
and in that case, you're basically taking technology that is only suitable for the world of offline uses, right? For audio, for video, for images, for speech, for things like this, and taking it and making it something that could be viable for real time on the right hardware, right? So in do getting that kind of improvement, getting that kind of 10 times or 100 times improvement is not that unusual in the field of machine learning. And if you had, have hardware that can support common uh, machine learning data formats and math, then all of a sudden you start to see those improvements potentially deployed in real world on, on the hardware. So I think that's potentially something that's quite exciting. Um, but I would probably agree with Sean that the incremental model of hardware improvement is dead, just in the sense of measuring things via FP32 teraflops and gigabytes per second of memory bandwidth. But I would be thinking much more about the kinds of acceleration that hardware can support for int8, for int4, for other data formats. I'd be thinking about the acceleration for machine learning and the acceleration for ray tracing. I'd probably want to tune into NVIDIA's CES presentations every year for a, for a bit of a preview of what that might look like. And I would probably have a more positive view over the medium to long term for consoles and for PC with the idea that maybe in five or 10 years, we are shipping experiences because of ray tracing, because of machine learning that are more eye catching, that are more immersive, that might grab players more readily and that people want to have the hardware to play those games, or at least they'll want to play them on something, and that could expand the market beyond where it is at the moment. I would kind of have a more optimistic view, again, with a lot of asterisks and question marks. But in the short term, I do think, like, I think PS5 Pro is a great piece of hardware um, based on what we've seen so far. I think whatever Microsoft's doing next will probably be a good piece of hardware as well. But I tend to think that in the short term, that kind of incrementalism, pushing things forward, increasing rendering resolutions, trying to clean up image quality, those are worthy causes, but I don't think they really move the needle that much, is my opinion. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, well, I've got uh, dual opinions on this. Let's talk about the sustainability stuff. Uh, not everything needs to be AAA in terms of how we generally see AAA at the moment. And uh, Sean, in particular, talking about that 80 to 90 hour games. Um, this is a relatively new thing that has happened in the last couple of generations where it seems to be the yardstick by which a game's worth slash investment level uh, is judged. And I think it's it's kind of wrong. Um, if we go back to how games used to be, you know, it was basically more about having a more mixed range of offerings for the market. And I think that's exactly what perhaps the market has forgotten and it needs to, to sort of have a good think about. The classic case of point in point is, of course, Astrobot, uh, which, you know, I'd actually call that a AAA game simply by virtue of its extreme quality. But it isn't a, um, a gigantic uh, effort along the lines of The Last of Us or Horizon or whatever. But, you know, it's a huge success. We need to learn from that or rather relearn from that because you know the industry used to be really great at having a diversity of games of different scale and uh, yeah the whole concept of how long a game lasts i mean we've got to get rid of it it's it's nuts um so yes sustainability triple a the whole nature of that um i agree with sean it's time for a real hard reset on the business model a hard reset on what it is to be a video game i agree entirely in terms of um the console hardware stuff um, and the idea that AMD is one. Um, well, I guess AMD basically owns the high-end console space at this point. Um, but if we're talking about who's really won, I mean, it's NVIDIA really, isn't it? <laughs> if, if, we're, if we're being brutally honest about it, because the PC market is becoming increasingly more and more important. And they've got like 80 to 90% in some markets market share. Now, how did they get there? They got there through constant technological innovation, um, amazing hardware, cutting edge features. That's how they've done it. Uh, a vision for the future of gaming in terms of the, the graphic side, at least. And with the advent of machine learning, that's going to permeate into, into gameplay concepts. There's no doubt about it. And you look at PlayStation 5 Pro, and it is effectively delivering in a console form the feature set that um, NVIDIA pioneered in 2018. Now, 
that feature set is going to be used for a lot more than graphics going forward. The Pro isn't really a teraflop play. If it was, it would be all about the GPU. It's about this um, more rounded view of what hardware a games machine should have. And it's effectively what NVIDIA has been delivering for, for so long now. So yes, basically, the teraflop war is over. I mean, the, the concept of what a teraflop means these days in the in the, in the era of, uh, you know, dual issue FP32 doesn't make any sense anyway. Um, it's all going to be about um, this combination of technologies coming together to create new experiences. And I think this is where I do agree with Sean, because the focus has got to be on the content. Um, the technology is the enabler for the content. Right. Uh, I guess the issue is to, you know, when you're looking at the market as it is, cross gen is effectively here to stay, I think, going forward. Um, you know, I fully expect <laughs> it's probably still going to be Call of Duty on PS4 by the time the PS6 comes along. It wouldn't surprise me at all. Um, and of course, we've got this um, notion that, um, well, Microsoft definitely want to make a handheld. That's not going to be a teraflop play. It's going to be, um, again, the combination of all of those features coming together um, to, to create something different. And, well, what can I say? Nintendo is doing it as well. It's the same, you know, it's the NVIDIA feature set, literally the NVIDIA feature set. So the, I do think there is going to be a shift. It is going to be enabled by technology and um, not necessarily teraflops. And I can fully imagine that, you know, I think Alex has posited the idea of a next generation PlayStation being, um, you know, perhaps a relatively weak machine to make it affordable, but only weak in terms of today's metrics. In terms of the hardware, I suspect, you know, it's, it's probably going to be extremely capable. And that's kind of maybe the place consoles should be because they've got to be affordable. Um, John. If I got that right or if I got that wrong? No, I think you mostly got it right. It's just the big wild card <laughs> here that both of you guys didn't really touch on is, again, the younger audience. I think the audiences have just shifted. They are shifting. Uh, I see this, like, so obviously there's larger studies on this, larger information on there. But just anecdotally, when I look at my son's classroom of friends, they all love games. Everyone does but not one of them has any interest in buying a console and buying games for it. Like they all just play on like laptops and iPads and phones or their own computers. And they almost universally are playing games like Minecraft and Roblox and all of those types of games. And that was not like that in the past. And I do think that going forward, this is, this is what we're faced with essentially and it's like we have this like maximum audience size that now exists almost within our age range that's wants to bu keep buying the types of games that we like, right? But how many of the younger audience is going to gravitate towards that? Some will. Some are going to enjoy those types of things. It's not everyone that's playing these forever games. But I think the audience, that young audience is largely shifting in that direction. Yeah, I'm not the, really the, the younger audience, um, and we have seen some data on this, they have very little interest in consoles. However, right. they do have an interest in PCs, and um, there seems to be a skew towards gaming laptops in particular. But yes. we're still, you know, gaming laptops, again, the market's owned by NVIDIA, and again, it's the same feature set. That so, is it. You're, you're absolutely right. I, I think PC gaming, that is, weirdly enough, even though, like, you look at the games that these kids are playing, they don't need anything really, but like they still are in school bragging about graphics cards and such and their, <laughs> and their computers, which I do think is funny. Uh, so I don't know. I'm just curious to see what happens on that front and like how long this, the kind of stuff that we're enjoying can be sustainable. Uh, I mean, I'm all, I already operate in a zone where like the stuff that I enjoy the most tends to be more skewed towards, you know, stuff that like 20, something years ago in terms of design and that's okay i can appreciate new stuff as well but that's just where we're at and I, f I just feel like this this shift is coming and i'm really curious to see what happens with it i think microsoft actually sees this as well 
And I think we're going right. to see this with their next generation of hardware and wh- where they go with Xbox. I think they have probably decided that this old style of model that they entered into back with the original Xbox, it is becoming less viable. It's not the future. And they need to do some sort of play to change the way that they approach games to both satisfy the current audience, but also sort of be there for the younger audience. And I don't think that they care as much anymore about just being like this brand where you go to the store and buy the console. They, they're just going to be pulling the strings and, and funding things and basically publishing and putting out software. They got their hands in all these pies, the mobile stuff. They've got the Minecraft like thing. They've got the stuff that we like, uh, I think between all of that, they, they stand to do pretty well. And I'm very curious mm-hmm. to see where Sony and Nintendo go. Like I did say before, though, Nintendo is the only ones really that feels like it's somehow sticking to the traditional console model like exclusively. And I'm very curious to see if they can continue, continue down that path because they've done very well yeah. there. And I think their, their mm-hmm. stuff, so that even the kids playing Forever Games do still sometimes seem to enjoy stuff on the switch, which, (laughs) which is interesting. Whereas I know, I I mean, again, anecdotal on my side, but also what you see online, I just don't, I mean, I don't see kids talking about playing on a PlayStation or an Xbox anymore. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Any final thoughts, Oliver? Um, Ah, geez, I think it's tricky. I personally, I'm not that animated about like what the relative split is between consoles and PC and where gamers are at. That to me, it's interesting. It certainly impacts things a lot, but also, you know, I mean, I, I'm more interested in like, is the overall size of the market increasing, right? And if that's through consoles or PC, I'm, I'm, I'm happy either way. One thing I am concerned about though, and this does tie back to Sean's comments and your comments is just the death of like that eight hour single player game that we had so much of, you know, 15 yeah. years ago, 20 years ago. And nowadays it does seem like everything has to be like the Witcher three or cyberpunk or <laughs> some big yeah. thing. Horizon. Well, you know, the Not eight hour game is basically like an eight hour initial playthrough. If the game's great, you go back and yeah. play it again. I mean, for, for like indies, it certainly movies. is true. And then there are some things that break the mold, like ratchet and clank rift apart. But in general, uh, there aren't as many of them as there used to be for sure. And I am, that is something I'm, I'm concerned about. And when they are pitched, sometimes they're pitched as um, purposefully budget price efforts, kind of like we saw with Assassin's Creed Mirage. So mm. I don't know what to think about that. I mean, I don't think it's a great thing. Personally, I'd love more smaller, shorter games. Uh, but, you yeah. know, I, I, that's just where the market is. And that's unfortunately player expectations have increased alongside improvements in graphical fidelity that games need to be super long. And, and that's just, I don't know. That doesn't seem sustainable, but I don't know how you get out of that either. Fair enough. Okay. Um, and with that, let's move on. Okay. So the uh, momentum towards the launch of PlayStation 5 Pro continues. And um, well, we now have firm details on what one of the generation's most visually impressive games is going to deliver on PlayStation 5 Pro. Remedy has put out a blog post detailing how it intends to enhance Alan Wake 2. Um, Similar to the base PlayStation 5 version, there's going to be two quality modes, a 30 FPS mode and a 60 frames per second mode, right? A performance mode. Um, Now, here's the thing. 30 frames per second is going to be featuring uh, ray tracing support, uh, which appears to be um, essentially RT reflections. Um, And it's going to have a base resolution of 1224p using PSSR to upscale to, to 4K. Good stuff. Um, now let's talk about the performance mode. This one is, uh, is, is intriguing because Remedy's decision for 60 frames per second here is again to use PSSR, but it's going to be upscaling, uh, from 864p, uh, to 4K. Previously, there was a, I think it was 870p, um, and it upscaled to 1440p, and then the GPU did like a sort of naive upscale to 4K. Um, The difference here is that they're looking to use uh, essentially graphics settings broadly equivalent to PlayStation 5, the base PlayStation 5's quality mode. Um, So, you know, essentially they're retaining the original resolutions uh, by and large of the base PlayStation 5 game, but they're upping 
um, the quality of those modes. And they're relying upon PSSR, uh, machine learning based upscaling, mm -hmm. um, to essentially deliver the image quality. Uh, I'm going to go to you first on this one, Oliver. Um, the ray tracing mode in particular, I mean, Alex has basically described it as lower than PC's low settings. Uh, reaction online has been uh, ray tracing at 30 FPS. This isn't really what I expected with the PlayStation 5 Pro, but it is what it is. And I think it's looking like a pretty impressive lineup of settings adjustments for each mode. Uh, what do you think? Yeah, despite any compromises that may or <laughs> may not be going on there with the BVH and whatnot, the distance of the reflections, um, I mean, I think it looks pretty compelling. The base PS5 version and the other console versions, of course, had these kind of grainy screen space reflections that I really didn't think looked that great, even when you didn't have any occlusion issues, it didn't look that amazing to me. Not, not the best screen space reflections implementation I've seen did not look that great in a lot of circumstances. This does improve things a lot um, in terms of the, that reflective detail. Uh, and I also imagine that image quality should be improved quite a bit, uh, going from 1224p to 4K here, which is like a similar magnitude to what we saw on PS5. Of course, here though, with PSSR as opposed to FSR2, which did not really flatter this game that much, I must say. So that's positive, yeah. and I think they're achieving good results there. In the performance mode, I think the results that we're seeing are maybe a bit more curious because doing 4K from 864p, even with something like DLSS, can be a challenge. And here, I, judging from this footage, the image quality doesn't seem 100% where I'd like it to be. Um, I'm not seeing necessarily an indication that some of those image quality issues in the performance mode on PS5 have been comprehensively addressed. Like in that dark ballroom environment, you are getting a lot of aliasing, a lot of specular nastiness. Likewise on the rooftop area, in the outdoors. And I think that PSSR probably isn't resolving a stable enough image there. But I guess to be fair, these are darker environments with a lot of like highlights. And that is a tough area. That was a tough area in the original game. Uh, on PS5, probably a tough area here as well for PSSR to deal with. So we'll have to see how the final game fares. But just in those two sample shots of performance mode footage, I do wonder if maybe a more conservative upscale factor might have served them a little bit better. But we'll have to see how that final game shakes out because this is just a, a very brief tease. <laughs> um, and it could mm -hmm. be the case too that image detail for sure is, is, is there, right? We can't quite tell from this, but it could be the case that, yeah, it's resolving a really sharp image, maybe not a super stable image, but we'll just have to wait and see for that final patch in a few weeks to see how that ultimately shakes out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, John, what do you think about this? Uh, I guess the first thing that you're hit with when you think about this is like they're instantly sort of going against Mark Cerny's presentation where the whole, the whole idea was like, Hey, you get quality mode, but with 60 FPS. But when you actually dig into the details, like you noted, that's kind of what the performance mode has become aside from the resolution. That is basically the PS five's performance mode. So this is really interesting then because they're kind of like both doing what, it was suggested the pro is designed to do, but then also still sticking with 30 FPS as an option to push the visuals higher. I actually do think despite, I, f I feel like when you say lower than low, that makes the results sound bad, but in terms of what actually is shown here, I think it looks quite good uh, despite those limitations. And it is a gigantic leap from the screen space reflections, which, as you noted, Oliver, they're extremely noisy in the original console version of this, just really, really ugly. And in fact, that's the other part, is that while I, I agree that the performance mode resolve is not perfect, uh, like you say as well, Oliver, I still think it's instantly more pleasing than what we saw previously, because I think this was a game that really did not work well with the FSR 2. It showed all the all the limitations of FSR two, which is so much like noisy, ghosty, smeary looking results. Like if you looked at a still shot of of the game in motion, where it's in motion, then you freeze it. And you look at a freeze frame; it's just a mess of pixels with FSR, right? Like it was bad. Uh, this does at least seem to be significantly less so, though still in performance mode less than I might like. But I do think this is a, this is, this is, this seems like a nice overall upgrade and I wouldn't mind playing this version. Um, obviously the PC version is still going to be king here if you have a very high spec PC, 
because the the full what what do they call it it's like sort of semi path trace it's still based on ra- rasterization but they gave it like it's like art was it overdrive rtx overdrive i forget what the option was on pc but you could push the ray tracing features way up yeah uh, beyond right. yes they they call it full rt but full it was RT. basically uh yeah it was uh a, a kind of merging of rasterization uh, right. GI and and, mm-hmm. and path trace GI, it, and it was effective. It's really good on PC, but it is very demanding. Um, mm-hmm. I guess I'm I'm a little the the one thing I would have liked to have seen. I don't know how much headroom they have. Is it would have been nice to have a 40 FPS mode here. Again, yeah, we don't know what the headroom is here, but it, I think that would have been a really cool thing if they could have gotten that working. But you know, this is this is kind of where I expect we'll be. I don't think I don't think quality and performance modes are going away anytime soon. I think we no, might see I'm some d- patches early on, aside from this, where maybe on PS5 suddenly you don't need to choose. Like I think Final Fantasy VII Rebirth is going to be that way, where essentially you want to use the high quality mode f- designed for PS5 Pro and it's 60 FPS and it's got better image quality and that's it. But I think going forward, we're going to see plenty of games that are just like this, where they say, well, if you really want this high quality, you still, you still got to go with 30 FPS. And right. it's just, there's no way, there's just no way to ensure that developers are going to always target X frame rate, right? Like just, just if there's power there, developers are free to use it as they please. And that's just how it is. Yeah. And that's how it's going to remain. <laughs> yeah. I mean, um, looking at the assets that Remedy has put out here, I think they are actually quite honest with the performance mode. Yep. If they had just stuck to, you know, um, Saga walking through the forest at a slow pace, <laughs> I think it would have looked at, you know, that it would have not exposed any of the issues that you're seeing here. And it probably would have looked absolutely fantastic. But, you know, they've actually used fast paced action, which is, you know, a challenge for any uh, reconstruction based upscaler. So you know, if this is basically um, what you might call uh, the most one of the most challenging scenarios for upscaling, I think it, it looks fine. I think people are probably still going to gravitate to the sixty frames per second mode. Um, in terms of the ray tracing mode, there still seems to be this kind of uh, misconception that that PlayStation Five Pro is going to be some kind of RTX forty ninety style rendering beast. <laughs> it's not. It can't be. It never was. Um, so this is entirely in line with expectations and yeah, the lower than low stuff is is quite an interesting comment to make, but at the same time, you kind of want developers to be producing, um, custom optimized versions, uh, for, for most consistent performance. That's, that's the bottom line. And, you know, you look at these ray tracing effects, you've got, you know, opaque transparent reflections. It all looks great. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing that. Um, Hopefully, good job, Remedy. Uh, this is going to be obviously one of the ones we fast track for coverage um, once we once we get to grips with the, with the hardware. We don't have it yet. Um, okay, let's move on. Next news topic. Um, I'm not entirely sure he's actually news as such because I'm pretty sure Gorilla has made similar uh, <laughs> comments in the past. But basically, they've drawn a line. Gorilla Games has drawn a line on uh, the Killzone franchise. They say they're quote unquote done with Killzone. Uh, They've moved on to Horizon. They've said that as a studio, we needed to refresh the palette. They'd done nearly three Killzone games. It was time to move on. And um, yeah, that's that's basically it. It's the end of Killzone. Um, I'm kind of split on this one because I do think that there was much to commend the games. There was much more potential left. And uh, I think it's fair enough if um, Guerrilla Games wanted to move on. But I don't think there's uh, you know any reason why the franchise couldn't continue. Uh, what do you think about this one, John? Uh, I'm not. I'm not sure that the Killzone name really means that much at this point. It was held up as like a Halo killer initially, and then it was held up to that Killzone Two graphics demo. They made good games with it, but I what I I more realistically what I would like to see is guerrilla games tackling a first person shooter again it's not necessarily kill zone and i think they almost kind of did that with kill zone shadowfall which i which i still maintain is criminally underrated and that people approach that game like kill zone and it doesn't really play like the the old kill zone titles at all where traditionally kill zone one through three they're very 
dare I say, they follow a formula similar to Call of Duty, uh, where it's like you're going through a bunch of scripted sequences and things happen around you and you're just reacting and shooting your way through it. And that, this can be fun. It's a cool shooting gallery. But Shadowfall was a more tactical game that seemed it seemed like their attempt at doing something more like crisis versus call of duty and i think there was a lot of potential there i think artistically and just conceptually that was such an interesting game and i would like to see them tackle that idea again but not as a launch game give them the time they need to make it happen uh that would be cool uh but i think it's pretty obvious that for now there's they're sticking with horizon and I guess that's okay. I, I'm kind of ready for them to move on already. Like there's been enough horizon around at this point that I don't really <laughs> feel like I need any more. Like between the two games, they're they're big, and like the surprise reveals of those games, it's it's known now, right? Like the story is known. I don't really think there's much more they can do there that would be as impactful. I would like to see them move on, but I don't think they will <laughs> anytime soon because Horizon does seem to be fairly successful. Right, <laughs> it does seem so, um, Oliver. Yes, I mean I think this is unfortunate because the Kill Zone games I thought they were very good. I especially like Kill Zone two and three in particular. Um, at the time, they were a little bit formulaic, but I think looking back, now that single player shooters are a dying breed, I think that like a revival wouldn't be that bad of an idea here. Um, I know that like horizon kind of open world stat building rpg is a much more dominant form of game these days but like something like kill zone that's like an eight hour campaign and a pretty casual multiplayer offering i think that might be pretty interesting and pretty good and actually a little bit refreshing nowadays weirdly the closest analog we have is something like call of duty but that's like an eight hour campaign plus like the world's most uh, fervently followed multiplayer offering ever with a ton of content and stuff like that. So it's not quite the same thing. Um, I do understand there's a small, strong commercial imperative to produce a game that has a really broad appeal in order to justify a $200 million budget. And I definitely sympathize with the uh, Gorilla Games comments here that expanding that market and having a game that is appealing to all players is very important. Um, and then there's like a web of decisions that comes out of that, I feel like, like the fact that we're seeing this Lego Horizon Adventures game, the fact that we have that remaster, the fact they're talking about a TV show now, that's kind of, it all feeds into this beast. That's this $200 million AAA title or $300 million AAA title, because otherwise it really isn't sustainable, um, absent that. But I mean, I'd love to see something like a Killzone 5 that's like $80 million or something, they put it together, it's a simple solo shooter, maybe it has some bigger environments, maybe they do some interesting things with it, but it doesn't need to be this gigantic kind of title. And I'd hope that's something that maybe they're not looking at now, but maybe in the future they could take a look at, or maybe another studio could take a look at, because, I don't know, I kind of feel like maybe maybe with older players especially, if you bring back this kind of 360 era style of title, format of title, Maybe you could get some eyeballs on something that's a little bit different from what we see nowadays, even if that thing is a little bit formulaic relative to the standards of, of 15 years ago, perhaps. Mm, interesting. Um, my opinion on this is that um, there's obviously question marks over the franchise, right, um, as to whether it should actually be brought back. I mean, Sony is a business. It's drawn by uh, revenues and profits. I'm assuming that they've looked at the sales of... Um, Kills on Shadowfall and realized, well, you know, we've got a studio like Guerrilla Games, they should actually be doing something more meaningful, uh, something, you know, that they want to do. And that's great for us in, from a business perspective, right? Um, however, um, I do think that there is, dare I say it, a brand equity to, to, to Killzone. I do think people look back on it with a certain degree of nostalgia. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Killzone 2, 3, uh, really good games. Shadow Fall, as you say, John, criminally underappreciated. And, you know, Shadow Fall, hmm, I've been thinking about the whole Horizon remaster situation with Nixis and what could Nixis do if they were given oh my gosh. the kills and Shadow Fall? Let them polish um, it up a bit because, you know, it had some issues being a launch game, release a PC version of it. Like, there's so much you could do there. It's, it's such an yeah. interesting game. Yeah. And, you know, basically just see what the reaction is. I mean, I'm assuming based on um, 
Horizon Zero Dawn Remaster's $10 upgrade option, which I suspect a lot of people will be using as opposed to paying full price for the whole thing. Um, I'm suspecting that the actual cost of that kind of project is probably quite manageable. And it probably would be similar uh, with Killzone Shadowfall, if not mm -hmm. cheaper even. Um, so, you know, <laughs> at some point, I think you've got to give it a punt. I mean, I was looking online to see how many copies Killzone Shadowfall um, sold. Uh, I'm not sure to the extent which this, this figure is accurate, but it seems to be 2.1 million, according to uh, the all-seeing eye that is Wikipedia. Um, and I do think they could probably actualize um, a lot more revenue from that game because it is fundamentally a good game. And, you know, PlayStation 5 would be a great venue for it, 5 Pro and PC, of course. And it needn't be an expensive game, you know, a punt, so to speak. You know, they could take a punt on it to see what to do next. As to whether Guerrilla needs to be involved, well, they don't have to be involved, but you know they're constantly evolving the Decima engine. If it was Decima powered, that would work. Um, so yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd like to see more. I guess, John, the the one sort of redeeming factor uh, about all of this is that um, Shadowfall actually shipped with the ability to run the game with an unlock frame rate, which means instant 60 frames per second on yep, PlayStation yep. 5. Yeah, that ended so that's up being great. a fun bonus rate. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I'll tell you what, whenever we talk about it, you know, whenever we sort of point out that, hey, you can play Killzone Shadowfall at 60 frames per second, there's a, you know, there's there's definitely a, a positive response to that. You know, people are like, wow, this is great. I feel like I needed, I want to do a retrospective video on that at some point. Because there's just absolutely there's so many ideas in there that are just so cool. Uh man, what an interesting thing. But still, the kill zone IP itself, I think it's ultimately lacking one thing that makes it easier to bring back, and that's characters. Most people right. don't like any of the characters in those games. I mean, mm -hmm. how many I guess there's probably some Rico fans out there, maybe. Most people don't care about any of those characters. They like the, the iconography and the design, the art direction, but there's no characters to it that are really memorable I, yeah I don't, I don't think that killzone has like iconic individual characters but i think like the Hellgast and the yeah. kind of industrial environments like that's all pretty that iconic, iconic to me i think especially from that second game which really pushed that aesthetic so hard yeah, for yeah, the time yeah. for 2009 coming on the wake of that of course that important reveal trailer i mean i just love to see obviously shadowfall would be great to see on ps5 in an enhanced form but i'd also just love to see two and three those ps3 titles that's personally what i'm interested in because those are titles that are not available in the modern psn infrastructure they're not available on ps5 maybe through streaming i don't know i haven't looked it up maybe through streaming but obviously not as a native ps5 title um and use that to gauge interest a bit you know bring back some of those older titles maybe not all of them maybe not like kills on one and liberation i mean possibly i'm not opposed to that obviously but bring those <laughs> titles back gauge yeah, audience you? interest if there is the, the, re the remaster, remember, of uh, Killzone 1. Uh, that for PS3, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think <laughs> you can play that on PS5 through streaming, actually. But again, not the same. Not the same. But I mean, I think, like, to me, if I was to pick one Killzone game that's kind of that, like, titular, iconic Killzone title that people are, you know, really taken by, it's probably Killzone 2, in my opinion, yep. just yep. because of when yep. that came out, what it represented... Uh, it's visual splendor, like the destruction, the particles, the incredible environment, the atmosphere, the shadow casting lights from the gun and all this stuff, the shadow casting muzzle flashes. I think it's just yeah. like such an iconic and interesting game. And I'd love to see it again on PS5, but I really, uh, I really do think that game is just something special. And I think if you brought it back, it would probably cause a bit of a, a, a wave of people being interested in that series again. So maybe that's something they could approach yeah. in the future. Muzzle flash shadows. I can just see <laughs> Alex's ears pricking up at the sound of that. Uh, okay. Um, that's that. Let's move on to our next topic. Okay, so I'm going to hand this one over to Oliver because I have no idea what game it is that he's testing here, except that know. it's called Wayfinder, and except that he's tested it on the PlayStation 5. Um, I'm now looking at a video on our YouTube channel that's uh, unlisted called Wayfinder Export Sample. Um, Oliver... Couldn't you take it away here? What's going on here? What is this game? 
Yeah, so this is an interesting title, I think. It launched in early access last year as a kind of MMO third-person shooter action game, but it's kind of an MMO in the modern sense where you have like shards and instances and things like this, but it is still an open-world multiplayer title. Um, and it relied heavily on action combat as opposed to tab targeting. Um, and I was keeping an eye on it. I am very interested in MMOs, still am, and I was keeping an eye on it. But there were big technical problems, issues with queues, plus it was free to play, which is kind of something that always leaves a bit of a bad taste in the mouth, even if I understand it's kind of necessary for a lot of these games, because you kind of become the product instead of the game there. <laughs> and the game is, you know, <laughs> oftentimes uh, using a bit of an exploitative business model and stat boost and things like that. I don't think that went on with Wayfinder, but it just was not that appealing to me. Um, and of course, it's an MO, so it, it, it requires a certain online infrastructure. And unfortunately, uh, it ended up with very low player counts. Their publisher, Digital Extremes, they make Warframe. They just dissolve their whole publishing division. So the developers went towards self-publishing, and it still wasn't successful. But they decided, like Final Fantasy XIV, to do a bit of a revival and reboot the game. But this time, instead of making it an MMO, they decided to make it a single-player RPG with optional co-op. So it's a very similar game. They've reworked a lot of the systems, the balancing, the item acquisition. They've converted all the paid cosmetics that were previously in the game to in-game items. And instead of pricing it at a free-to-play price, they've just said it's $25 US <laughs> or $33 Canadian. Uh, with no other costs at present. So just a straight purchase, no cosmetics, no DLC, nothing. All the content in the game, which I think is a really interesting way to spin this back up um, and try to make it a success. So I checked it out on PS5 yesterday. It just got released on Tuesday after an, a period in early access. And this is like the full 1.0 release. So visually, I think it looks quite nice. It's UE4 and not anything too crazy, but the art looks great. The cities in particular have a lot of geometric density and interesting designs and cool looking art. It's a very good looking game for a multiplayer centric title in particular, I would say. Uh, I think it's a very satisfying Unreal Engine 4 title for a multiplayer title. That's how I put it. It's something extraordinary, but artistically it's quite pleasing. On PS5, there are two modes, quality and performance. The big difference here is that the performance mode gets a bit of a settings cut. Like grass density and shadows are both compromised in the performance mode. But this is like a really weird configuration because the performance mode drops TAA entirely. Like maybe there's right. post A. I think there's post A in there, but it looks pretty raw, really unstable in motion. And then the other weird thing about it is that both the quality mode and the performance mode to me counted at 1080p, which is weird too. So it's like. Oh, that's that's so that's so strange to have have so much commonality <laughs> between them, but then have these settings downgrades that are probably pretty marginal in terms of performance impact. I'd imagine for a UE4 title. The other weird thing is that in the menu it says the quality mode targets 30 FPS and the performance mode targets 60. So pretty typical split there, but in reality both target 60 FPS. Like they'll both run unlocked up to 60. There's no 120 hertz support, but they'll run up to 60. And then this is kind of where things get more interesting, perhaps, because indoors both run at 60 perfectly fine. Um, but outdoors, both of them are kind of not quite equally compromised, but quite heavily compromised in the sense they both have quite severe traversal stutters, judging from the frame times when they're running around. Um, the performance mode is a little bit better in the combat encounters in the outdoor areas but the quality mode really suffers there. So it's like, but bo both have the traverse stutters, which is very annoying there. So yeah, I think it's an interesting game. It's a fun game. I think the combat is very good. It's reasonably polished. It's well worth checking out if you like MMOs or maybe grindy RPGs here, because that's essentially what it is. I think $25 is a pretty fair price, but it, it, you kind of come back to the engine tech and well, Unreal Engine 4 is delivering some good visuals here. That traversal stutter is kind of a, uh, just kind of irritating for this open world game or open environment game where you're traversing lots of space, you're seeing lots of assets at once, and UE4 is just not coping that well. So, yeah, I mean, I imagine PCs may be a little bit better on a high-end rig, but you'd probably still run into the same problems there. So, I don't know, an interesting game, I'll keep playing it. And the indoor areas are, like, you do spend a lot of time there, and they do run a lot better, for sure. But it's just those outdoor areas with UE4, it's just not a great combination, unfortunately. Uh, I'm curious as to, I mean, I'm assuming this was 33 of your own 
well-earned Canadian bucks <laughs> yes. that you laid down for this. So I'm kind of curious as to, was it just the narrative, you know, this idea of a free-to-play game that suddenly become a single-player fest that, that made you uh, buy it? I'm, I'm curious as to how this came onto your radar. Well, I was interested in it from when they like announced it, I think in 2022. I thought it was an interesting title and an interesting game. But like when it comes to those MMO titles, um, I mean, the free-to-play part of it was was a big factor. But with MMO titles, you kind of tend to sometimes not want to be there on day one sometimes, especially if you otherwise have a busy schedule. Because um, like I, rem- I remember 10 years ago with Wildstar, which I also played, a uh, big MMO project from a lot of ex-Blizzard people. Very exciting game, very good game but it folded within like a year or two <laughs> just because the player interest right. wasn't quite there. So I'm always a little bit nervous about new MMO projects and I'm especially nervous about free to play ones because it's just not a business model that you'd like. And even if initially it just cosmetics and you're like, okay, fine cosmetics, whatever pretty soon. If you're in dire straits, you move on to the pay to win stuff. <laughs> you know, that's almost inevitably what happens if the game is not successful, sometimes even if it is successful. So yeah, it's a combination of the fact that it was an unproven MMO and the fact that it was free to play. But now, now that I've come back to it, I think it's quite a good game. It's just kind of a shame that there are some issues that are pretty fundamental here, probably won't be addressed. Configuration on PS5 is kind of funny, but not bad necessarily. I'd for the most part just play in that quality mode. That's my advice. Don't touch the performance mode. You don't get <laughs> don't get TA. It's not a good looking experience. And the performance level is pretty similar between the two. It's just that fundamental traversal stutter issue you're gonna run into regardless of visual settings, I think. Fair enough, John. I've been watching your feed here. Looks like you've been tuned out for the most part. Uh, <laughs> any 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 input? Well, I mean, I think the story around this is super interesting. I think it's cool, and I hope I wish this the success. It's just the way Oliver talked about it. Uh, the only walk away I have from this is that it's MMO. It used to be an MMO, and he doesn't like the performance. Uh, so what <laughs> what is it about? Like what when you play this game? Like what do you what are you loving about it? Like what what are the what's the elements that say man playing this game feels awesome? Like gameplay wise, like what's what's cool about this? Well, I mean, I've only, I've only played for a few hours, so I couldn't really offer a considered opinion considering how long well, these games can be. True, but like you know, yeah. any I feel like any good video game, even an MMO yeah. like that, the within, within the first like thirty minutes, you should have a good sense of like why this is worth continuing to play. Yeah, and because of their good story, I'm actually curious to hear more about it because that's that's like a cool thing to support, you know? Uh huh. I think they do a good job combining like action combat that is very shooting focused. And there are three different kind of characters and classes. So the character that that I picked was more shooting focused, but there's also a melee combat character and a more stealthy character. Mm -hmm. Um, They do a good job of combining kind of combo based gameplay with very twitch and action oriented gameplay. I think that's the interesting thing to me. It's not just tab targeting, but it's also not something in the total other direction like Destiny or The Division, where it's basically just kind of a conventional third person shooter. It's somewhere in the middle. There are abilities on timers. There is a combo system, but also all abilities are aimed, which is different from that traditional tab targeting system. And the combat feels pretty good. It's a little bit floaty. It's not quite as polished as you might see in some other titles. That's my feeling at the moment. But it's also a pretty interesting approach to things. And I think that like overall visual package as well is quite compelling because it's very rare that you see an MMO style game look like this and Mm. work like this in terms of that open environment that actually is delivering a really high level of art quality. Like even out of modern World of Warcraft expansions or something, you aren't getting this level of artistic quality, I think. I think it's very impressive looking. So it's really the combination of that really strong visual appearance and then this interesting combat system. Um, But yeah, I've only played a couple hours. That's my early impressions of it. And it does seem like it expands as you go along Lots of new abilities, lots of new um, elements to the game, lots of new items, combat, whatever, new guns, things like this. So it's a very extensible game in that respect. Like they built the game with the expectation that as an, an MMO, you needed to pack it with hundreds of hours of content. That's my impression. Right, right, right. Grind the end game, things like that. Now that's still here, but it's just single player oh, with optional co op elements as well. So you can have like a little three person co op party. 
but it is a, a very different way to frame a game like this. But it is still basically an MMO, just a single player one. So I think that's an interesting spin on things. But yeah, I think that's basically my uh, my appeal there. All right, man, I hope they find success. This sounds like a difficult situation. My first impression looking at your video was like, oh, it's Fortnite graphics. It just looks like a Fortnite <laughs> style game. It's that same yeah. like cartoony, over stylized humans running around. But based on what you're saying and what they've been through, it actually does seem like a fairly decent game. And I think it's really cool that they were able to uh, shift from that MMO model into sort of a single player game with optional multiplayer. That's uh, that's cool. And man, yeah, I, I wish them the best because uh, it's tough out there right now. So yeah, cool. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, let's move on. Okay, not so much a news story now, again, but what we are going to be talking about is Sonic X Shadow Generations. Um, the game is out at the time of recording this. It's just come out. Uh, we weren't sampled with review code until a couple of days ago. Yeah. Um, and we had to buy the Nintendo Switch version. But John, you are Mr. Sonic. You love these games. And this yep. one in particular was on your radar for quite some time. You've got some first impressions that you're going to share with us. And I think we all want to hear them. Sure. Yeah. So first of all, you know, obviously this section is, I guess for Oliver, it's, it's like, this is, this is my wayfinder if you will. <laughs> so, I enjoy I enjoy these types of games and just to distill it down, this is a boost boost sonic style game. I like them because they combine this like extreme speed of like a very fast racing game with this like idea of platforming chaining together combos that almost gives you that same high as like a Tony Hawk game combined with like great music and just sort of like you get in the zone like when you really feel it and you're whittling down the time and getting to these stages faster there's like this like it's just an excite a level of excitement there um that I really find engaging and I think they they do that really well and so the pitch here is that They've essentially bundled Sonic Generations, the 2011 uh, 3D game, which I think was, I would widely say, was the best attempt at doing Sonic in 3D uh, up to that point, and probably still one of the best. Uh, but then they've created essentially sort of a sequel. And I almost compare this to something like uh, Bowser's, uh, what, what is it? It's the 3D world with Bowser's Fury, where it's like you, you basically have two games where it's split. From the main menu, you can either choose Sonic Generations or you choose Shadow Generations. Shadow Generations runs on a much newer version of the Hedgehog engine. Uh, it looks significantly more impressive visually, although Generations holds up remarkably well. Like, it's really beautiful still. Um, and there's just they're doing a lot of cool stuff with the stages. It plays really well. And the main difference here is that between all these stages, that like white overworld area from Generations instead of just being a side-scrolling section now, it's opened up in this massive 3D zone that sort of like unfurls as you play. Sort of, they say it was inspired by Sonic Frontiers, and you can definitely tell, which I think works well. Now, the first, the first thing to note here is that both of these on PlayStation and Xbox, and of course PC, uh, they can support 60 frames per second. PC can support up to 120 only in Shadow Generations, unfortunately. Um, there is weirdly a quality mode, which... <laughs> uh, okay. But only only in the Shadow portion. Sonic Generations is just flat 60 across the board. Although there is a, there is a weird thing where uh, it actually... There's a couple little bits of slowdown that occur that don't happen in the backwards compatible version of Generations running on a Series X at 60 which I thought was very odd, but that's fine. The thing, the thing though, I guess with shadows side is that, um, yeah, it does. It has that weird 30 FPS mode, which just feels terrible, but at least at 60, it holds very smoothly. So there's a lot there. It's good stuff. I'll, I'll have more to say about those versions, but I think if you're playing on any of those platforms, I think you can, you can have a good time switch though. Uh, this is very preliminary. I literally just got this <laughs> installed on the switch because we didn't have pre-release access to it. Right. Rich bought this and we were checking it out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We, we uh, couldn't actually access the game until launch day, which is today. Today, And, uh, I was uh, giving you a little bit of heat there for, <laughs> for, for your participation in the wayfinder section, but you are actually playing 
<laughs> Sonic X Shadows Generation of the Switch. Correct, because it the download just finished during that section, and I uh-huh. wanted to talk about it here. So I literally just got my first impressions, and then when we took a drink Hot break, off the press. I also it's played the hottest some of takes. So this is very preliminary. I haven't done any FPS analysis, but my first take is that it looks great, but the frame rate has issues, and essentially it seems to be capped at thirty but there seems to be very inconsistent frame persistency. So the whole thing just looks kind of juddery and not nearly as as stable as it should. So not only does it seem to be 30, but it's not even like a stable looking 30, uh, which is not good. I'm, I, I am happy they kept the motion blur in because they, they often cut that out of the Switch versions of Hedgehog Engine games, the post effects, but this actually looks great. I guess I expected Shadow Generations to run at 30. It should have run, but I'm a little bummed out that they only managed to get to 30 for the uh, Generations 1 part, you know, Mm. because that's an Xbox 360 PS3 game, guys. Uh, I know the Switch is what the Switch is, but I'm a little surprised that they couldn't get that up to 60, especially given how we know from PCs the requirements of this game it's not that high unless of course they've done some changes to it that have suddenly made it more demanding than it should be, which based on that extra slowdown you get versus the backwards compatible version, maybe mm. it is, but I, I don't think 30 is good for the switch version. And I'm just going to say, I, I'll have the whole report out, but if you're looking at this game and don't, don't even consider switch unless it's your only option is what I'm saying. And even then, mm maybe <laughs> we'll have to a wait a lot of people see. do consider switch though and it's like one of the primary platforms for that particular no uh, that's the problem right right like sonic is big on the switch this is where it should shine uh even last year's sonic all-stars or superstars on all-stars superstars it took a gigantic graphical hit on switch but it ran smooth you got a 60 fps experience out of it i think that was the right approach but that was also unity not hedgehog engine hedgehog engine right. is definitely a heavier engine from what we can tell uh and they do a lot with it it's 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 shocking how good it still looks but i think the performance situation is unfortunate to say the least yeah. so um i've just been thinking about ukulele the impossible layer which was essentially a game that was designed to run at 60 frames per second on the nintendo switch and then it basically scaled gracefully upwards onto all other systems and you know if your primary user is going to be on the nintendo switch i think that's probably the best way forward right i i think that's what they did for sonic superstars but i think in this case you just can't really do that because generations already exists right yeah uh they're not going to make a shadow portion of the game that looks worse than that right they needed to push the visuals forward somehow and if they can't even get generations running at 60 like what are you going to do right like maybe there's ways to pair it back but that's a that game is fixed in place like it is what it is um what makes those games challenging i think is that the levels because of the speed of the game you traverse a tremendous amount of terrain in a very short period of time so like it's an engine that has to handle absolutely gigantic maps and uh i i i think that's just you know there's 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 limitations there i don't i don't know enough about how the hedgehog engine works on the backside to say where their bottleneck is but clearly as we've seen before they're just not able to get great performance out of it when running on the Switch. But hey, at least it's better than Sonic Boom on the Wii U. <laughs> okay. Which was CryEngine, um, baby. A CryEngine Sonic game. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, before we recorded, you were talking about texture filtering. All right. Uh, yeah, I'll show that as well. Um, they basically don't seem to be using anisotropic filtering, and I'm not sure why. <laughs> okay. it's weirdly not that obvious most of the time because of the speed and the motion blur and the way the game works but like every time you're in like a an area with a large flat open surface you see like oh man the texture filtering looks like uh dmc devil may cry day one on ps4 uh where it's just like there's you know it's basically like trial and filtering <laughs> yeah i don't i don't know why it to me it feels like 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 an oversight like not a performance thing Right. Okay. 
Yeah, because I'm just looking at the Slack channel here and quote unquote, it's driving me nuts. That's what well, he said. Yeah, I mean, I think Oliver would probably agree. Yeah, we're cut from that same cloth when there's like a visual bug or visual issue in a game like that. It just like sticks with you, you know? Yeah. And, yeah, that is uh, annoying. I think so. I, I hope they fix that. I'm going to, I'm going to talk about that and show examples in the video just cause like I, I would like them to fix that. Cause it's not a cool thing. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, any input Oliver? Um, no, it just, I don't know that original 360 release was 30 FPS. So yeah, so it has version. good frame pacing. Oh, and not the case in the switch. I suppose that's a bit right. of a downgrade. So it's not like <laughs> that. I mean, I would expect a bit more sort of but it's also like that it's kind of <laughs> par for the course with switch ports unfortunately especially considering the fact that you know this is probably like a modern wrapper or, or whatever don't you think or or whatever they're doing there yeah um, no i mean i don't know I'm, I'm curious about the engine stuff the fact that on pc generations is capped at 60 versus right. the shadow portion which and the way they're split leads me to believe that it is just literally two separate engines it's like the older hedgehog engine that they made <laughs> run on the new machines combined with uh the most recent version of the engine yeah so, that's, yeah that strikes me as a bit of a disappointment john to be honest yeah i'm that's not to say there haven't been changes there are some visual differences in generations uh like the way the depth of field works and a few other effects they also added the drop dash uh, which didn't exist in the original. So they they made changes to it for sure. It's not just the original. They also redid all the videos. So all the cutscenes are now 4K. Uh, they also redid all the UI, for, so it's 4K, because before it was just 720p and didn't upscale very well. It was very blurry. Uh, so all that stuff is improved. So it is good now for sure in that regard. And we've never had an official disc release version of Generations that runs at 60 FPS on consoles okay right so that's also cool okay good stuff uh well i look forward to your verdict i guess next week but yep. uh, with that let's move on okay next news topic and yes it's time for the panel switch out john and oliver have departed and joining me alex battaglia hello today i love the idea of them departing like yes like, like they're dead <laughs> they, they're departed they'll, they'll be back don't <laughs> worry uh we've got yeah. a few topics to get through alex so uh, i guess yes. we should just crack on uh, let's begin with uh god of war ragnarok it's been patched again and i'm assuming you've got comments about it yes yeah, so this is now i believe patch six if i'm not mistaken uh basically when god of war ragnarok launched i thought it was a good enough release that most people would load up and not have issues with it. But I had a number of smaller scale issues that had to do with the game not being graphical parity with the PlayStation 5 version due to bugs, as well as a couple of performance hiccups depending upon your setup. But they didn't affect all setups uh, universally. It was just like specific areas of the game and or um, specific CPU combinations. So patch six looks to be adding more fixes in. Uh, the previous patches uh, fixed up issues with tessellation performance that they actually chalk up to driver changes uh, okay. in their patch notes, which is interesting. Uh, they also um, looked at fixing the uh, problems with the game's displaying of fog that I pointed out in my previous video, which is apparently an NVIDIA only issue that was around at launch. And then uh, a couple other smaller scale things. But uh, I would say the biggest scale one that happened as of this patch, patch six, is that Zen 2 performance is fixed. And now I have heard that um, essentially when we talked to them and they did a an interview, they mentioned how they looked at scaling CPU load based upon where caches are in the CPU. So keeping things in cache as much as possible and avoiding going across to different cores or smaller cores that would have separate or worse caches. And they basically traversing that distance to do intercore communication and slowing the entire process down. Now that worked really well for modern Intel and it worked really well for modern Zen. But if you go back to Zen 1 and Zen 2, where things were slower, that inner core communication was even slower than it is in modern Zen. Uh, it didn't work. Essentially, their scheme didn't work, and it would limit the game to using far fewer threads 
hardware and logical threads than it possibly could have. And it led to really bad performance. If you go back to my original video there, you'll see like the 5600X is beating the Ryzen 5 3600 by like oh, like a little bit more than 100% or yeah. so, yeah. Uh, which is ridiculous and unheard of. And, you know, uh, that Ryzen 5 3600 is usually a great analog for the PlayStation 5 CPU in a lot of our tests. Not the exact same, but it gets there in the performance usually. And uh, it was like dropping into the 40s mid-combat, and that was not right. So as of this patch, I've measured a 40% improvement taking this area that is like <laughs> okay. in the 50s into the 70s uh, just via patching. And the core spread is now much like you imagine it should. And if you go into combat in the area that I just showed off earlier, where it was in the 40s, uh, there now like the worst frame rate is like in the mid 60s or so during that combat. Uh, this is one of the heaviest CPU areas of the game. That's why I chose it. Um, and basically it's gonna, and the frame times look a lot, lot better this time around. So God of War Ragnarok, it is getting there. There's still like one or two things that I think need to be looked at. Like the ultra wide performance is kind of uh, the last thing that I mentioned in my review that hasn't been ticked off as well as the, uh, the missing ray traced Q maps, uh, which yep. I do not know if and when they are coming at all. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's interesting. I mean, the Zen mm -hmm. 2 thing is is curious to me because obviously the source code they would have had would have been optimized for that particular CPU architecture. So, so yeah, that, that was a bit of an eye-opener. <laughs> the 100% differential between uh, the architectural shift there was, uh, I'd say, uh, unexpected. But it's great to see that effectively almost all of your critiques of the game have, have now actually been fixed and as you say yes the game was actually in pretty good shape to begin with right it, it, it was it was like i don't know like i when i look at them and the team that they are of just four core engineers plus a little bit of help from sony santa monica for qa and oversight um i don't see that as a very large team where I imagine very easily things could fall through the cracks because right. it's just four people trying to cover every single base between UI and getting GPU and CPU scaling right everywhere. And not every test configuration is going to be tested as a result uh, and put right in the place where it should be. Uh, so I, I'm more forgiving of games that have a smaller scope, even though I think perhaps Sony should give the game a bigger <laughs> scope. Right. right. Uh, that has nothing to do with the developers, though. That's everything mm -hmm. about publishers. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's good stuff. Um, any final notes on this? I mean, I'm I'm really quite happy with the way the ports turned out in the end. And there there is, I guess, it, it's slightly disappointing that there are any cutbacks at all versus a console version. But it right. kind of it does scale nicely in performance terms. I, I guess. Yeah. Now on modern GPUs, uh, modern CPUs, it scales more in line uh, with where it should than it did before, for sure. Um, I mean, I haven't done any sort of PS5 versus PC testing, but it is on the like lesser great side of that scale from what I understand from reading people online who've done that, um, using like-for-like -like settings that I've derived in my review, uh, which I originally didn't do, uh, but maybe now that's something I can do uh, that <laughs> we've got a, okay. a port that is more in line visually with where it should mm -hmm. be. Yeah, I'm just curious that there's going to be a PS5 Pro update to this because where do they go? I mean, maybe to <sighs> SSR, uh, what? I don't know. It's, <laughs> it's a weird one because like it's already pretty high res and it's using like TAAU from 1440p-ish resolutions or higher. Yeah. And it looks really good even in the performance mode there on PS5. I Like, I don't know, higher res. Uh, I would have loved to have seen them use like real ray tracing there instead of just cube map tracing uh like actually like dynamic objects and things with like uh you yeah. know the world geometry with textures that would be better okay cool okay let's move on so alex we're not out of the woods yet in terms of uh, patch analysis <laughs> silent hill 2 you put out a pretty epic video on that um for the <laughs> Thank PC you. version which um certainly caught a lot of attention and uh Clearly, there were some fundamental issues with that and with implications for Unreal Engine 5 games more generally. Um, there is a patch now for Silent Hill 2. I'm curious what has changed. And I'm also curious if you've got kind of like, um, what can I say, uh, maybe off the record or, or certain mm -hmm. reactions to your original content that, that 
might be yes. slightly more illuminating. Indeed. So uh, I got to say the patch looked at fixing a couple of things, but the one that was relevant for my video was the uh, gratuitous hitching, frame time hitches all throughout the game experience. And they, for a game that is atmospheric and slow paced, like Silent Hill 2 is, I really think it's a massive detriment to the atmosphere of the game, kind of like how Dead Space is a yeah. slow paced atmospheric game and that really ruins it. Um, felt the same here. Now they mention in the patch notes that it's supposed to fix hitching issues right. due to okay. sky generation, which is, I've honestly never heard of that for Unreal. So I'm not exactly sure what exactly it describes, but I did do tests and I did them at 4K Ultra DLSS performance, just cause I have like for like for that, uh, on the Ryzen 7 7800X3D, uh, all running down from the hilltop into the town. And I've got like three separate videos here that I sent to Oliver. And what you will notice, for example, in the first video, right, like when you get out of the car and you're going down the hill there, um, there are a number of frame time spikes there. And this video I've sent to Oliver only has like frame time spikes on it. I cut everything out of it. It's just supposed to show the frame time spike because that's the important thing. And it's basically showing that there are a number of them that are eliminated completely. And that is very good. But you'll also notice that if you watch that footage a couple times, well, not all of them are gone because specific ones are gone, but not all of them. And the other videos I sent to Oliver as well, for example, like when uh, I run with James here through this um, like gate area, you'll see that a number of them still line up there. Uh, they, in fact, they're almost all there. So. And, you know, this other video running down the, the little highway in town, uh, crossing like in front of this house here and a bunch of like these traffic cones around along the way there. You'll also see that a couple of them are gone and a number of them remain. And when I did my original video, I did show that all of them were always lining up one to one. The issue wasn't apparently shader compilation where you'd imagine in one run after the first time you played the game that they would disappear. They were always in the exact same place, literally right on the dot, always, every single one, because they were just happening when you'd move through the world for some reason. And here it cleaned up, I mean, just like a rough from my butt number, it cleaned up like maybe 40% of the ones that I, you encounter going from the hilltop to the town, but the largest ones are actually still there. And those definitely have to do with what you imagine is typical Unreal Engine traversal stutter, where actors are actualized after loading, which is usually the cause. It's not the like moving of data itself, it's the actualization of actors instantiating them after they've already been put into memory and make them gameplay code ready. And then pff, it causes a massive CPU frame time spike, uh, which is not good. And it's still technically all throughout the experience as a result there. So they cleaned up some of it, but uh vast majority of it still remains and i still think the game needs uh some serious patching okay uh, my one question about that is when you were doing your uh delta time analysis yes. and your fixes did that fix all of them no uh right. well <laughs> it can't fix uh any of the frame time spikes that would be occurring above uh you know like 33.3 .3 milliseconds which even a 7800 x3d would show there's multiple right, okay. points when you run through the town where it could go up to like 60, 75 milliseconds on a standard X3D and, you know, something like Ryzen 5 3600 territory, it's like near 100 milliseconds. Or but even, you had like a before uh, and after for that specific scene right. of James, right, where it was essentially cleaned up. Um, yes. Are we now at some sort of midway point or is it still that the <laughs> fundamental issue hasn't been addressed? The fundamental issue of delta time not being correct is not uh, fixed. As a result of this, uh, technically any frame time spike that occurs even below 33 milliseconds will still cause an animation hiccup. Um, and there are a number of reasons for that. Uh, this is kind of like my, my behind the scenes things that I've heard. <laughs> I've talked with, now this is not directly from Epic people, but these are people from Ep that work with Epic and Unreal Engine, like extremely low level. And yes, Unreal Engine at its core does have issues with calculating delta time. It is not necessarily a great variable frame rate engine, actually, at the end of the day. 
And depending upon when things are updated or actualized within a frame, for, so from like beginning of zero millisecond to 33 millisecond, let's say, like depending upon during that time when things are updated, like animation state, for example, for actors or camera, uh, it will show off the issue more egregiously or not. So that's why we see a slight game dependent difference there. But the Delta time stuff is actually not right in the first place in the engine. It's just certain games will show it off more readily than others. Okay. And uh, there have been proposed fixes on the GitHub for this, actually. And we'll see maybe now if they change in the future. Mm -hmm. Okay, but that's your mm -hmm. update. That's everything we now know about Silent Hill 2, <laughs> where it is now and, and where it's heading. Yeah, I, in this case, it does make me sad because like John has said on Twitter and I agree with him. And when I was playing the game, I was just very, I really liked what I was seeing in terms of voice acting, visuals, uh, perhaps the best usage of Lumen I've seen in a shipping game and uh, minus the issues it has. Uh, you know, it's really good, but not getting performance stable, I think, is a big issue. And I hope Bluebird keep pushing to make it better. Uh, okay, well, thanks for that. Well, we're going to move on now. Okay, so now we're going to move on to supporter Q&A, which is the part of the show where every week I post on our Patreon asking our supporters to suggest topics and put forth questions for consideration uh, in DF Direct Weekly in this particular section. And um, I choose the best of the ones that we're best equipped to answer. I'm going to kick off with this question from Anxiously Chrono Figured. IDF crew exclamation point. What if the next Xbox console was a hybrid where both in X and S tier you get the same handheld that plays Game Pass games, but in the dock you have either a weaker in S tier or stronger X GPU with an ML component that would allow you to play the latest games on a 4K screen? That's what I'd call the biggest technological leap in gaming. Exclamation point. Cheers, exclamation point. Uh, so, Oliver, I love a good bit of next generation theory crafting, <laughs> as you know, but um, I, I'm not even sure I understand the concept of this one. <laughs> yeah, I, mean, <laughs> I guess you keep think? you in the power brick. <laughs> no, um, yeah. well, you'd have to route PCIe over the connector. So maybe you do something like Thunderbolt there. Um, and when you do look at. Uh, EGP performance or performance over Thunderbolt is always compromised to some degree, especially with higher end cards. So that's a problem. Um, it would be possible, I imagine, but it would be potentially a problem with USB 4 or Thunderbolt um, maybe 5 that's in the horizon that has more bandwidth. Um, the CPU side would be a bit of a problem because you aren't getting a very powerful CPU in that small shell, I can imagine. Um, but to me, maybe the biggest issue practically is not, you know, the, the kind of bean counter issues there, but it's just the fact that hot swapping would probably be very difficult or impossible there um, in terms of, I mean, it would be impossible in terms of getting like that switch <laughs> style experience of having a console that you play on the go, plug into the dock and you're playing the same game in the same moment, same settings, whatever, right? That's... That to me, I think, is the appeal of the Switch concept as a hybrid machine. It's that flexibility. It's implied in the name. It's that Switch, right? And here it would be more like, well, connect it to the eGPU in, reboot the game. It'd be much more PC-like, I'd have to imagine. Um, so that would not be as compelling of a concept, I suspect. Okay. Uh, John, does this concept, let's put the uh, logistic, <laughs> logistical practicalities aside, do you think this makes any sense? Uh, uh, no, not really. I, I just think this <laughs> yeah, is right. additional cost and confusion in a market where they really don't need that. And I, I just, I don't think that's this is something that would hit very well. I mean, what they're basically proposing is like, do you buy the high end dock or the low end dock, right? So, right. Even you know, aside from whether or not this would work that's what they're suggesting. And I just feel like that creates, it doesn't really change anything with the situation. Uh, Cause you're still selling two SKUs. Do you include the dock, the high end dock with the, with this, like, do they have a bundle where here's the handheld with the high end dock? Here's a bundle with the low end dock. 
Like, how do you even market this in a way that like is easy to parse when people are already not loving having to deal with you know multiple SKUs of a console as is? I just feel like that's not really a, a very compelling sell to the average consumer, especially given where Xbox is at right now. Like, this is just not this is not the play for them. Yeah. Yeah, my thoughts on this one. Let, let's talk about the logistical element of it. Um, I love it when people suggest this idea of a handheld that docks into uh, a much more powerful piece of kit, but you've got to understand the implications of this. Mm -hmm. um, the dock would need to have more memory, really. Um, otherwise, you know, you're going to be constrained by whatever memory limits you've got in the handheld. And the handheld can, of course, have a low amount of memory. You know, it's, it's, you don't actually need massive amounts of memory in there compared to like a 4K box. Ultimately, what you end up with in the dock is um, uh, essentially a machine that could also be a home console, really. I mean, you know, if you're going to have a, a, a piece of silicon and memory in a box that connects to a TV, you're halfway there to having a complete console. <laughs> so there's there's not really this concept of the of the GPU in the dock. It's, it's it, I, I love it. I really do. But it just doesn't really make sense in terms of the way um, uh, the way technology is generally made. And secondly, you've got a massive marketing problem there. Uh, it just doesn't doesn't really make sense. Nintendo hit it out of the park with the with the Switch concept uh, mm. as as they delivered it in 2017, which is to say, you know, it basically runs faster when it's docked. But you know, otherwise, job done. Um, in terms of what Microsoft is going to be doing, um, I'm just putting my money on at least two machines, at least probably more. I mean, if they're talking about the greatest technological leap of a generation, that inevitably will mean an expensive machine. If you're talking about a handheld, then, you know, that's something else entirely. Uh, so, you know, what's the middle ground that, you know, you've got two extremes there, there's got to be a middle ground. I think the, the technological leap will be with machine learning, though. I mean, uh, going back to that Sean Layden discussion, you can't just increase your GPU teraflops anymore. It's just not viable. Uh, we've kind of seen it pushed out as far as it will go with PS5 Pro and it's $700. So, you know, something's going to have to change there. But um, yeah, GPUs in docks um, typically doesn't work out and I don't think it would work out here. Uh, let's move on. This question from Cero. Guten Abend, DF chaps! Exclamation point. Uh, that's going to be the end of any kind of semblance of a German accent. Uh, would you say that the gaming industry becoming more risk averse on? But would you say that the gaming industry is becoming more risk averse on both the creative and technical front? The PS4 era introduced titles like God of War, Horizon, and Spider Man, but their sequels, while polished, seem to play it safer and feel less impactful. Are we seeing a broader shift away from innovation this gen, or is it too early to tell? Uh, John, it's kind of a continuation of what we were talking about earlier, but ultimately, I mean, yeah. yes. <laughs> yes. I mean, I, I think large companies have been moving in a more, they've been developing games in a more risk averse fashion for like a decade or more. Uh, and I think it's just driven by this, like, well, first of all, launching a new IP is actually very difficult these days, especially if you're spending a lot of money on it. So there's already this risk of failure that's high. Throw in a new IP and that risk increases dramatically, right? So I think it's just like do, these companies are dealing with this reality of games being so expensive to make. And ultimately, while the creators are there to make something interesting and cool, like the company's thinking, how can we like how can we make money how can we actually develop something and then make money from it and that's a difficult thing these days and obviously being a sequel in a very with a very large property attached that instantly makes the chance of success higher so it makes sense why those businesses would gravitate towards that it just doesn't make as much sense anymore to take those chances like it used to because in the past you could you could have a successful game with far fewer sales and that's just not the reality anymore and so and i think frankly the audience doesn't show up people say they want original stuff but the people that say that are unfortunately in a minority i'm there with them as well uh 
a lot of people just don't show up for that stuff unless it's it's man there are very specific instances where it can happen like you see from software has managed to to create this little niche for themselves where people just love what they make they are drawn to that company and so they can actually do new things even though their games follow similar formulas but like you when they announce elden ring it's huge because people know that's what it is if you can get your company into a part where people into a point where people are following what the company is making what the creators are making more than just the brand behind it then you can do this but i think most big developers they're just not at that point right those are like the rock stars the kojimas you know cd project red from software they somehow managed to get there but most are not there mm -hmm. okay um oliver what's your take on this yeah i mean uh, i don't know i think that it's just there's a problem right now where games take so much effort and development time to make and so much money that there are fewer opportunities to succeed and also fewer opportunities to fail. Like when you look back in like the 2000s, it was possible to make a game like Dark Souls that was a little bit crazy, or Demon Souls rather, that was a little bit crazy for the time, was doing some interesting things and created a genre off the back of a production budget that probably was in the you know low tens of millions, perhaps at most there. Um, it was just not Ninja a Ninja Blade. Not, <laughs> yeah, not, not 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 a super expensive uh, title to develop there, and to actually do something new. Here, the problem is that you're dealing with two hundred million dollar games that take like five or six years to develop. So that's a problem. Um, but I'd also say, just as a different spin on this uh, uh, question here, I'd say that less than innovation, I'd almost rather focus a bit more on variety. Like, I'd love to see a wider variety of titles. I'd love to see more platformers, more single player shooters more racing games, especially arcade racing games. Um, I'd also like to see innovation and iteration within those genres. But if you go back 15 years ago, I think the games industry was in a healthier place with regards to delivering consistently in all those genres and all those areas, instead of now where it's like, well, you have plenty of souls likes, you have plenty of open world RPGs, but we've kind of cast some of these genres back to the wayside and the only way you can really get them um, in some instances, is through the use of, of older software there. So I'd love to see more innovation in the industry. I would also love to see the industry explore some genres they might have left by the wayside, because unfortunately, there's not a ton of variety in that big AAA space, or at least not as much as I'd like. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree entirely. Um, I don't think, you know, once the, the, the kind of template has been established with games like God of War Horizon and Spider-Man, uh, you're kind of... <laughs> dare I say it, locked in, you know, they can, they can iterate, but, you know, anything kind of revolutionary is, is, is probably going to be too risky. The key is to basically, as I said earlier, is to diversify your offerings, do more games, smaller games, and just make them great. Right. And um, obviously the indie space, um, thrives on this sort of thing. Oh, you mean um, like, uh, what was it? The Prince of Persia game earlier this year. Well, that's that's a, <laughs> an interesting point, right? You know, that's an interesting point where it just just didn't hit, and, it, um, and the expectations the were was a arguably smaller, too high. It was a smaller game. Uh, it was beloved. People loved the game. It was super well received. And unfortunately, yeah. Well, we know what happened. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, but on the flip side, you do have games as again as we discussed earlier, like Astrobot, which yeah. definitely definitely hit. And, you know, I think we are going to be seeing more of that kind of di diversification because um, <laughs> it's just not sustainable to make every game a AAA multi-million, multi-hundred million dollar blockbuster. Um, hmm. In terms of the question here, are we seeing a broader shift away from innovation this generation? Well, it's not too early to tell for sure. We are, and things are going to have to, have to switch up for sure. Um, let's move on. Okay, let's move on for this question from... Hordita Yichuo, Yichuo, sorry, I've just managed to offend the entire Spanish speaking audience there. <laughs> uh, but let's move on to the question. Um, Hello, DF exclamation point. Hope you're well. Question for John. Are you still using the Quest 3? What apps slash games have you been trying? I am playing Batman Arkham Shadows and it's great exclamation point. 
a uh, bit of disclosure here you actually did some consultancy work on on batman so you're probably yeah. very happy to see the uh the hugely positive response to that release john yeah 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 i did i did a little bit of stuff with them on that so that's why i haven't like reviewed it or anything but it's it's super cool i have to admit it turned out awesome <laughs> uh yes i do still use the quest fairly often actually and this year so my my go-to still is a lot of the team beef stuff like i just i can't get enough playing what they've done especially the doom stuff there's all the quake doom 3 that stuff doom though especially just so awesome but i also did played a lot of um humanity uh which was also on psvr and pc but like playing it on the quest it just was perfect because you just by removing the wire from the equation it just made walking around that little scenery awesome and for those that don't know it's basically it's from the, the enhance the guys behind Tetris Effect and, and Riz, obviously, uh, and others. And it has that same sort of trippy vibe, but you control that the, the shining light uh, dog, if you will. And it's basically like weird, trippy lemmings. It's really cool. Hi. I also played through on the Quest, and this also came to PSVR too, and I actually really recommend it. It's Max Mustard. I hate the name. I think the character looks extremely stupid. But I have to admit, it's very good. These guys essentially said, "Hey, what if, what if we tried to make a new Astrobot, like the but like the VR Astrobot, uh, from PSVR one? They essentially made a game like that. It's not as good, but it's surprisingly good. Like it is actually like within like, uh." It's within an arm's reach of, of that Astrobot on PSVR 1. And it's really only let down by the somewhat unappealing character. But mechanically, it does that same thing where you're doing full 3D platforming within like a very VR-oriented space, but you're bringing in tools and, and weapons and, and gear that you manipulate directly with your hands. So you're directly interacting with the environment, and then you're also platforming around that environment with the third-person character. So it's super, super cool. I do recommend that as well. And yeah, Batman Arkham Shadow. They clearly set out to make just like a stunning looking game for this thing. And it really is like, I would have to say, possibly the best looking thing I've seen uh, on the quest so far. Just in terms of like understanding, they understand the limitations of what this hardware is. And then they built this like, very beautifully lit dark environment that places a uh, sort of like really prioritizes like light and shadow in a way that we don't really see typically in quest games but it feels like lessons learned lessons from looking at stuff like i would say metal gear solid 2 like how do you do great lighting when you don't have like the hardware budget to do all all of this in real time like modern games right so they're very particular about where they do the lighting and the shadow and how it's all comes together. And it's, you know, it's pre-calculated stuff, but you know, when you have Batman shadow, like you to fly, you like grab your Cape and like pull it out like this. And like, when you see that shadow out in front of you spread across by a light source at your rear, it just looks super cool. And they somehow managed to translate the mechanics of like an Arkham game into VR like it really does it's like arkham asylum not the not the open world games it's more like arkham asylum where you're going through this sort of somewhat non-linear world you're exploring you're gaining new tools to access new areas uh you're dealing with enemies along the way there's puzzles there's platforming all this kind of stuff all put together very nicely and the way they did the the melee combat just like that the way the fists and stuff work it it manages to feel surprisingly good because the problem with fists in VR is that you don't have any pushback when you punch somebody yeah uh, in VR your fist keeps going right but they manage to do these these hit effects like when you finalize a punch you'll hit them and then it's almost like the game has this like slow motion effect where you slam against them they go flying and you kind of hold your fist in midair for a second lingering there as you send them flying so because they go flying the way they react to it it never feels like oh my fist should be going through them uh i can't imagine how difficult it was for them to get that the melee feel right but it actually works uh plus the stealth stuff like 
going up above, you know, it's got tons of the stealth sequences where you're up in the rafters, you know, you're using your little bat grappling hook to like move around above them and taking them all out. And it's exactly like the traditional Arkham games. So, uh, yeah, if you got a quest, definitely check all of, you know, check that out, check them all out and keep playing VR. I saw that story this week that, you know, it's a lot of developers are, can't justify making VR and the market is tough right now, but there is still cool stuff being made, including on PSVR two, by the way, like all the platforms have good stuff coming out. And I do think it's worth, it's still worth playing VR today. It is still a okay. cool medium. I only wish we could see something else like a half-life Alex level of production value. That game still feels like an anomaly. It's like, what if the whole industry went towards these, like, you know, high, super high end experiences, uh, and you get a glimpse of what that might be. And then nobody's ever been able to follow it up. It's just not realistic <laughs> business wise. Okay. Valve is like one of the only companies in the world that could realistically make something like that. Right. Like they have the, the spare capital and this desire to push technology in interesting ways to do it, but nobody else really does. Let's move on to the next question. Uh, this one comes comes from uh, Toriel. Uh, Hello, esteemed Jets! Exclamation point. The upscaling used in the PS5 Pro update for Forbidden West. Do you think the future project that it originated from is Death Stranding 2? And will Guerrilla Games use this instead of PSSR going forward? It was surprising to hear Oliver give the picture quality, quote, un quote unquote, best in show. Yet it wasn't using PSSR. Uh, that was a bit of an interesting twist, wasn't it, Oliver? Yes, yes. I mean, in terms of the image quality there, it was just super stable. The foliage looked great. Fine details resolved really clearly and really stably. It was also reasonably sharp as well and quite detailed. I haven't seen that combination from PSSR yet. Perhaps we will. But at the moment, um, just judging from what I saw on the show floor and judging from what I've seen from various previews, I've not seen that kind of level of really, really pristine image quality. It almost reminded me a little bit more of what we see in DLSS on PC in terms of the just overall level of image fidelity that was being delivered there. Um, but to answer this question, uh, I think it sounded from what they said to me like Gorilla's work on an unannounced upcoming Gorilla title and not Death Stranding 2. I think that makes more sense given that the focus of tech development in that studio is obviously on their own software and that goes over to Decima to Koji Pro. But, you know, I think it's I think it's uh, internally focused there. Um, it does sound like it's a technique that will be used instead of PSSR. And I wouldn't be surprised to see it in Death Stranding 2, especially on the PS5 Pro. I wouldn't be surprised to see it there. It could very well be there. But I think that the locus of development on this, the, the genesis of development perhaps, was an upcoming title from Guerrilla. Perhaps that Horizon MMO or something similar, and now it's being uh, ported over backported to Horizon 2 and possibly to other titles as well. Hmm, interesting. There's a lot of unknowns here, right? And obviously at the launch event, Sony quite rightfully probably would have wanted the um, the focus of attention to be on PSSR, right? Um, but this seems to be like a homegrown effort from Guerrilla Games, which they are preferring over PSSR uh, for whatever reason, presumably image quality reasons based on, on your analysis. Um, and I'm assuming it would, well, there's a lot of assumption going on here, but I'm assuming it's probably a compute-based solution. There's probably a, play, a base PlayStation 5 version as well. I guess the other thing is we don't really know what the base resolutions are. Uh, well, I did, did, I did count it, and it was like 1440p-ish, 1584p-ish, 24K there on PS5 Pro, right. though. So if there is okay. some accommodation for that base model... We haven't seen it yet, I don't believe. Um, but if okay. it is on the base model at some point, that would be a different story. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, a lot is being asked of PSSR from much lower resolutions uh, in many games. So, you know, this could be something that um, genuinely looks great simply because it's already got a, a very high base resolution. We just don't really know. But it's certainly from Gorilla's perspective, the best solution 
dare I say it, in the here and now for that particular project. Um, John, what do you think about it? Yeah, I mean, that is really interesting, but I feel like what you're saying, Oliver, is pretty much right. But it's also just a reflection of Gorilla's own great work in the image quality space, especially as of lately. Um, I think it's important that they were one of the, they're one of the pioneers of just reconstructive image quality, right? Like they're, they were there over 10, more than 10 years ago now, I would say, right? Or about, about 10 years ago, like Killzone Shadowfall is essentially like the origins of this stuff where they're working from a lower right. resolution, mm -hmm. right? Obviously that caused some issues for some people, <laughs> but, uh, yeah. C c can we not talk about the court case? <laughs> but still, uh, <laughs> Then, then when it came to Horizon and the PS4 Pro, their checkerboard solution, I think, was one of the most robust of the bunch. Uh, it looked very good. It was a little bit softer, but it was super clean. And I'm looking at when I so I just did that video on Horizon Remastered, right? I genuinely think that the image quality you get from Horizon One, as running on PS4 Pro or PS5, is significantly better than many, many, many games using FSR2 today. Like it's significantly mm -hmm. better, uh, which is, you know, there it is. But obviously the caveat here is that a lot of the other games we've seen using PSSR are resolving from much lower resolutions, right? Mm -hmm. So what, what happens when PSSR is at a similar input res as whatever Gorilla is doing here? I, I don't know. Well, I, hopefully yeah. we get to find out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think there are broader questions as well, you know, um, Gorilla are the masters of using the existing hardware that's there, right? And, they are. Um, uh, you know, who's to say that in future projects, they're not going to be using that machine learning block for other things as opposed to um, PSSR if they're happy with their own solution. Just don't really know at the moment. Um, but I guess the other thing, of course, is that we just haven't seen a pure uh, Decima engine designed for PlayStation 5 yet, you know, in, in any of their shipping games. Uh, which which is a bit of a an eye opener <laughs> four years on um you know obviously uh horizon forbidden west was a cross gen project project there were enhancements in the burning shores d l c but fundamentally that project is based on cross generation technology, which is uh, quite amazing when you think about it uh, anyway let's move on uh, interesting question here from mr bespoke uh, hello oh. d f exclamation point has John played any modern game consoles? on those CRTs via the Retro TIG 4K, especially the remastered retro games that have appeared lately. Uh, so back in the day, we did a video about how um, the Xbox Series consoles and PlayStation 5 looked on a CRT, specifically the FW900. Mm -hmm. But this is a bit of a different question, right, John? Um, have you ever considered using modern consoles on a CRT using the Retro TIG? Is, is that really the role of that particular piece that of kit? That's a weird one. I think what he's talking about... So the Retro Tink's not designed to be used on CRTs, really, but there was some kind of, like, downscaling options in there to get, like, sort of, like, decimation like uh, that people have experimented with. I don't really do that. I, I haven't found that interesting, to be honest, but um, mostly. But I've definitely used uh, modern hardware on CRTs. And there's really two ways to go about it. There's VGA monitors and then there's the uh, standard definition, 15 kilohertz style CRTs. They are very different as you know, right? Uh, for HD content, normally you would want to use more of a VGA monitor as far as, yeah. as a CRT, because they can resolve much higher resolutions, but there That's is sometimes the 900. Exactly. But sometimes there's benefits to using, uh, a 15 kilohertz CRT. I've done stuff with like, I've connected my PC uh, to my regular SD CRTs in order to play Sonic Mania in 240p, for instance, since they included an option in the I and I file to reframe it as a four by three game. You can actually send that out at using, uh, I use a, um, what is it? Um, I'm forgetting the name of the device. It was like an Emotia, uh, an Extron Emotia something that allows me to basically get 240p out of a modern PC, which is kind of crazy, but it works. And for games like that and certain other things for retro stuff like that, it's very cool to be able to play that on an old school CRT. So mm -hmm. 
there's definitely ways to do it for the tink though uh, retro yeah it's, it's kind of like more for like your xbox 360 well there's a lot of uh uses for it obviously but the idea of having proper scaling for an xbox 360 and ps3 for a 4k panel that's kind of like quite so isn't it that's um i don't use the i actually use a different device for that because of its size and just simplicity for this and it's the um the the morph uh from black dog dan and them uh the pixel fx morph and the purpose of that is that I literally, it has the screws for it. I mounted it behind my cabinet and I have it so that the secondary output from I have three outputs on my AV receiver, one of them goes to this. And if I, because it has a toggle switch, unlike the Tink, I can literally just click the switch on. Um, it comes alive and then I just switch the AV receiver. Uh, all right. No, I switch the TV to the, its unique input from that morph and then you get nearest neighbor scaling so oh. anything i input into that over hdmi gets nearest neighbor scaled up to 4k uh, so i always use that for switch to get very clean scaling but i've also used it on older stuff as well like if you play a ps4 game or an xbox one game and it's capped at 1080p for instance the results look a lot better if you input 1080p directly into the morph and then you get the 4k scaled out to your screen so you're basically mm -hmm. shifting where the scaling's being done, so which is cool. Uh, let's move on. Final question. It's actually two questions. I'm um, going to tackle these in order. Pretty much the same question, however. <laughs> um, uh, first of all, first of all, um, very professional Dodo asks. No question for me. Just sending thoughts and prayers for when PS5 Pro comes out, and a flood of requests arrive to test every single PS5 Pro enhanced game, including every base PS5 game with performance problems. Good luck, gents. Uh, this one from uh, Degenerative AI. Uh, what are your PS5 Pro hashtag content plans? With over 70 games confirmed and counting, there's no way for you to cover them all. Do you already have a selection in mind for which games will get top priority? Uh, we have had a we have had a discussion mm. about this, uh, and you're quite right. And essentially, what it's going to come down to is the hardware is going to arrive at some point, and uh, we will test games. We'll probably do like a broad range of of superficial testing, and then you know the ones that are interesting will cover. Um, <laughs> it's that simple. I think obviously there's stuff like Elden Ring, which is, you know, game boost. Obviously, we need to test that. Um, there's, there's sort of like categories of titles that we've we've got in mind for testing here. Mm -hmm. uh, is there anything specific that you want to test, Oliver? Alan Wake, Diablo, FF7 Rebirth, uh, Hogwarts, both Last of Us titles, uh, Star Wars Outlaws, uh, all the Spider-Man games, all the Insomniac games, all the Resident Evil games that are getting updates, uh, Village and 4 are getting updates. I don't think 2, 3, or 7 are getting updates. Okay. <laughs> Probably missing a few. I mean, that's but that's just updates. There's also boost modes. I want to try boost mode with a lot of uh, titles. I mean, Final Fantasy 16 would be one. Avatar would be one. Metaphor Re Fantasio. I mean, there are a million games. I could, go, I could be here all day. Uh, Matrix Awakens. I'd love to see if that fixes anything with matrix awake oh, that's an interesting tons, tons point yeah yeah tons of games there um mm -hmm. but yeah i mean i think that probably we'll be doing a number of bigger videos um dedicated videos on on big titles and then maybe you know some compilation or direct style coverage on on a, on a broader variety of titles um that's maybe a bit a bit uh less um dedicated in that sense but there are so many games and i think people will have such a broad interest in so many titles that we do need to have um some way to tackle as many as possible we will inevitably we'll not be able to tackle all of them but i think probably we can get to the ones that people are really interested in i would hope i think this is going to stretch into december and january and beyond because there's going to be more titles arriving as well yeah um John, anything particularly exciting that you have in mind? Well, I mean, obviously the From Software stuff, I really want to check out Elden Ring, Armored Core 6 on there just to see if they can level out the frame rate. I want to see 120 frames per second games uh, because there's yeah. quite a few. Those that had performance limitations, essentially, uh, would be interesting. I think a lot of the Call of Duty games had 120 modes and they were yeah, not yeah. always consistently 120. Can they get there now? 
Uh, I want to find that out, especially the, also those with DRS. We'll see what happens there. Mm-hmm. Games like Rise of the Ronin, I recall, having extremely variable performance. Can it fix that? Um, stuff like that, really interesting to me. I just... I kind of want to just go through and find some of those those areas where the system really struggled. Uh, another one I'm curious about, as you recall, because it runs in a different it runs in a different way than you'd expect for backwards compatibility. But I want to try uh, Assassin's Creed Unity disc version to see if it. Okay. Because if you recall, that was one of the few games that does not actually hit stable sixty on PS5, but it does on Xbox Series, right? Yeah, I so, think that's the CPU limitation. There's certain titles where they have put in yes. um, uh, basically clock speed blocks um, so, to ensure it, compatibility. Exactly. And so I just want to see what's the behavior of that stuff now. Like, is there okay. any change at all? Like, just all these weird little edge cases to see what happens, basically. Do you have any particular interest to see uh, what the PS5 Pro can do with Life of Black Tiger? No. <laughs> but actually Lichdom Battle Mage, which I think may have already been sixty on the PS5 base, but I won't I need yeah, to check mm-hmm. that. But if it's not, we should finally get there. <laughs> yes, yeah, absolutely. I'm also oh, for- very interested in uh Wukong. If we get a locked oh, yeah. 45 FPS, that's what I'm into. <laughs> I, I yeah, I, that's well, gonna that's gonna mm-hmm. get a patch, right? I assume that game will get patched for I hope so. You'd hope I don't know it's that it's new. on the list yet. Oh boy. Yeah, yeah, it needs mm-hmm. it needs some serious help. Oh, all of the the uh, the other SquareSoft stuff like Final Fantasy 16 and uh, Forspoken yes. could really benefit. Oh, a lot. okay, it's yes, an interesting especially one. Especially Forspoken yeah. had really weird performance issues, if you recall. Yeah, so I'm curious to see yeah. where that where that is now. Final Fantasy 14 also has that 4K mode. Has various modes that somebody could dot really somebody do call up Mark. Let's get him on the line. <laughs> yeah, he's gonna be happy. Yeah, call up <laughs> Triforce Duddleson for that one. Yeah. <laughs> to, to sort of round off the discussion, should I do an unboxing video? I think you should because I think your your unboxing videos are the best. I think it's good content. You approach it with that deadly serious like British humor that's just very um like you're you're there. You're like I'm wasting my time. Let's okay. just go through I'm going to make a prediction. I think it's hilarious. Now. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to make a prediction. Um, I think that there's, it, it's the packaging is probably going to be very, very similar to the PlayStation yeah. 5. So, you know, basically there'll be that kind of um, outer box, uh, very thin card yeah. um, sort of overlay. You <laughs> open it, there'll be a white cardboard box inside you open the white cardboard box there'll be the controller and there'll be the (laughs) the cables on top you take that component out and then inside will be uh the console wrapped in white wrapping silk uh, those kind of two cardboard surrounds you take that out and you've got a console you know maybe we could do something a bit more interesting we could uh potentially attach the the optical drive and uh, the stands you could you could do some size comparisons and stuff but ultimately yeah this this concept of you know it's it's a console you know we should find really... new inbox examples of every playstation and then open them all in a row yeah you know maybe we just need to maybe <laughs> we're just doing it all wrong maybe we should actually you know make our own packaging for oh. the playstation 5 pro and put it inside there just to introduce some variety <laughs> maybe you know it could be uh Fashioned in the style of the Lost Ark. <laughs> that would be an unboxing video. That hopefully be... with no death wraiths coming out. <laughs> no, hopefully not. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so that's it. That's the, <laughs> that's the end of this particular edition of DF Direct Weekly. So please do like, subscribe, share on the uh, off chance that it was indeed uh, useful or entertaining. Ring bells for messages that may or may not appear. DF supporter program, join us. Uh, contribute to DF Direct Weekly. Get early access. There's a lot going on there. And of course, store.digitalfoundry.net for all of our merchandising wares. Uh, But that's all from us uh, this week. Thanks for watching.